Friends and subscribers, this is China News for June 2015. Big news in China and across the world as China challenges the gold fix, announcing that by the end of the year, yuan-denominated fix will come into effects. Now, what this means here is that the LBMA announced that the Bank of China would become the first Chinese bank to participate in the gold fix. In other words, the Chinese will have their say in setting the gold price throughout the world. Significant in part because um, China likes to buy and sell physical gold and silver rather than paper contracts. So this uh, yuan fix, when it takes off, it could compel local buyers and foreign suppliers to pay the domestic yuan price for gold rather than paying the Western paper price for gold in which they rarely take delivery on. So if the Chinese have it their way, there will be less uh, shorting, less non-delivery of gold and silver and uh, less manipulation of the gold market because we all know that uh, Chinese love precious metals and gold is huge in China, has been for many years and will continue to be. So if China sets a price for gold that is say 1500 and in the West is 1200 what will that do to the gold market? Well, you can guarantee that the gold price will rise. I don't see any scenario where this will not have an impact to the upside for gold and silver because the Chinese are paying cash and delivering the product. Now, we know that China likes to buy more gold than sell gold. Their gold sales are primarily for the domestic market to keep gold within China. But with this uh, gold fix, what they'll have to do is they'll have to have some kind of control on the outflow of gold to make sure that they're not bled dry of all of their gold stock. Meanwhile, being able to offer a great price for gold bullion to sellers internationally who want to also get involved in owning some yuan. So it's a win-win for China because they'll be able to broaden the reach of the yuan and the international market. They'll also be able to obtain more gold, they hope, and uh, hopefully in their eyes it won't rock the boat too much and deplete any gold reserves that they may have. So big deal by the end of the year. You should see this having a huge effect on gold as the Chinese are all about physical. And physical is where it's at going forward, and that is where you should be as well. China's hard landing may have already begun. This is something I've been talking about for months and even a few years, that uh, the Chinese hard landing was going to take effect, and it's going to depend on how the Chinese handle it as to whether or not you'll feel it a little or a lot in your country. Chinese stock market mania has been going nuts over the past 12 months. $6.5 trillion in value. For perspective, that value amounts to 63% of China's 2014 GDP. That is massive. Everybody is doing it. Whenever I log on to any kind of social media or instant messaging or uh, contact any of my friends here in China, everybody has a photo of uh, a screenshot of stock market picks or something that they've invested in that they are tracking and some of them even bragging about the gains that they've made. But when the Chinese stock market, the Shanghai index, for example, drops as much as 5 10% in one day, you don't really hear any kind of feedback from them. So uh, you've got people in this market that don't have any business being there, okay? They're not even day traders. They're just, you know, mom and pops, people that are working professionals and they have nowhere else to store their money. They've got some gold. They've made the payments on their overpriced houses and they do uh, stock market picks as part of what they feel is a risk worth taking because of the increased performance of the Chinese stock market, the Shanghai Exchange. China's exports dropped 2.5 in May year over year, but get this, in April and 15% in March. Now this continues to be a problem. When your exports drop over 15% in a month, then you've got serious problems. 
More seesaw action on the Chinese markets. Forget about Greece. China could be a much bigger problem. Now, with so many people in the market and being such a huge economy, uh, this is going to cause uh, action on these markets that's never been seen before. Um, let's take a look here at the perils of faith-based investing in China. What does it look like? Well, basically, uh, here's a picture of what the common day trader is in China. Silver-haired Chinese housewives, because we know China is an aging population, and with inflation raging in some sectors throughout China, it is prompting a lot of housewives to invest money in the stock market to get some kind of return. One of the silver-haired day traders was interviewed and said, if the government wants the markets to go up, it'll go up. Well, uh, with that kind of logic, um, who could be wrong, right? Uh, and the flip side, if the government wants the markets to go down, they'll go down. But the problem is much deeper than that. It has a lot to do, again, with the valuation of a lot of these firms that are on the stock market. Uh, some of them have no business of being listed. And we all know that business practices in China are questionable at best. So this can lead us only to believe that there's going to be some huge adjustments and some sad stories coming out of China when some of these silver-haired investors lose most of their retirement money. The cartoon of the month is a doozy. Take a look. Mummified meat. That's right. Mummified meat. Outrage in China over what appears to be the craziest story of expired meat that I've ever heard. Over 1,000 tons of smuggled frozen meat, including some meat more than 40 years old, have been seized by Chinese authorities. Now this uh, should come as no surprise to anybody that lives in China, but for some people this will be almost unbelievable. The Chinese will do anything to make a profit, and that includes selling meat that has been mummified. So, before you go to your local Chinese restaurant, before you buy meat that is frozen in a supermarket in China, ask yourself, how old could this meat possibly be? There is a chance in China that the meat you buy at the grocery store could be older than you are. This one is sure to be of high interest. China's flagging property market might mean fewer divorces this year. What they're looking at here is the rise in Chinese divorces over the past several years and trying to find reasons for why uh, they seem to be rising year on year. Um, Chinese marriage and divorce rates per 1,000 people, and you can see that year on year it has grown significantly, and that has many factors, um, one of them being the fact that a lot of these uh, newlyweds come from single child families and also the fact that uh, Chinese um, uh, social progress for women being that uh, there's more and more information out there for Chinese women and their liberation movement so to speak is coming much much later than it has in the West and that could be another factor. Um, however the social pressures here and the reasons why people get married in the first place I believe have more to do with it. Divorce rates in Beijing went up 41 percent in the first three quarters of 2013. Now that had a lot to do with the tax on second home purchases and if the first time homeowners after they get the tax break if they divorce they can take their name off that first house one of them can and they can purchase a second house and get the tax benefit on that second house if they divorce so some couples are divorcing in order to have that second home to be able to speculate on believe it or not that's how it is in China uh, a lot of these marriages here in my opinion have a lot more to do with business concerns than they do about true love the um, social nightmare that is China, that I've talked about a lot, um, leads a lot of Westerners to scratch their head and wonder um, why people get married in the first place when it uh, usually amounts to nothing more than a business agreement between families. But that's how it is in China. It seems to, well, work or not work for them, depending on how you look at it. But in any event, divorce rates continue to rise. People continue to look at ways to buy more than one home so that they can speculate on the property market. And with the uh, property bubble being in effect here, that kind of throws 
a wrench into the workings of what uh, has been uh, very profitable in some markets for people to uh, get married, get divorced, get the second home, and perhaps remarry. That is legal. They could do that and get away with it and get huge subsidies on two homes and get married a second time. More dangerous than cocaine, cheaper than a Big Mac. What's happening in the world of drug trade? Well, this... Uh, phenomenon is happening all across the United States. What you're seeing there is a drug that is on the U.S. list of illegal controlled substances since 2014. Flaca is a drug that is legal in China and they produce a lot of it here. In fact, it's legal to produce in China, legal to consume in China, and legal to ship out of China into other countries. So, this cheap drug, a dose that can reportedly go for 3 to $5 on the street, and one kilo can cost $50,000, but in China it goes for chicken feed, as little as 1500 for a kilo of this substance, and that is causing all kinds of problems in the United States. And uh, that uh, is just another uh, drug in a long list of drugs coming out of China and the Golden Triangle that is being shipped around the world. And, of course, China is profiting from it. Close to one-third of China's Great Wall has perished. This is of no surprise that anybody who's been to the Great Wall of China, and if you've gone to both the tourist section and a section along the wall that is not part of their tourism tour plans, what you'll see is that, in fact, um, the actual section that is real or close to real of the Great Wall it is crumbling and it has been crumbling for quite some time now and uh, in China things are not always what they appear as a lot of these ancient structures in China have been rebuilt over time or rebuilt completely recently uh, there isn't a whole lot of stuff here that is actually surviving structurally from the past dynasties and that also goes for artifacts too because as you may know um, Shanghai Shek took a lot of the artifacts that were remaining in China over to Taiwan so I always tell people that if you want to see some of the best jade and bronzes and some of the best uh, uh, silk uh, stuff in China you got to go to Taiwan and go to the Taipei Museum because that's where the real stuff s survives uh, much of the other stuff here is either not of the highest quality or is fake and also a lot of the stuff did go to Great Britain and go to Europe and go to other areas uh, through opium wars and trade throughout the years but uh, it's really kind of sad to see that the Great Wall is crumbling and the Chinese aren't doing enough to protect it. They're building railroads, but they're not preserving the heritage of what is the Great Wall, one of the great man-made structures over time. So should the Chinese be building railroads or should they be preserving their heritage? This is a clash of generations in China as there uh, appears to be uh, more people interested in the latest iPhone and Apple gadgets than they are in Chinese heritage. China says Japan's presence in South China Sea is unacceptable. These types of news stories and rhetoric come out of China weekly, although they're not always reported in the Western media. Um, what it shows is that the disagreements in the South China Sea are really just beginning. And uh, Japan and China still have some deep disagreements and some deep resentment between the two nations. And it isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, I believe that uh, the only resolution is having them fight it out eventually and take uh, sovereignty of areas in which they can challenge and win. Now, at the same time, uh, Turkey is concerned over China's Ramadan bans on the Uyghurs in the northwest portion of China. Um, there seems to be uh, doublespeak in China when it comes to religious freedom as uh, they allow any religion to practice here practically, yet there are restrictions and there are certain licenses that must be granted in order to practice religion here. And China is not kind to the Muslim religion, although uh, they uh, claim that they are. Um, not allowing uh, full practice of religion is not religious freedom. They will uh, 
prevent them from practicing during certain times, will not allow them to fast, asks for licenses, and likes to limit the size of churches and mosques and all kinds of things. So these types of restrictions uh, leave people to want to go elsewhere to practice their religion. And, of course, we, we've known that this has gone on for a long time as Uyghurs in the northwest area of China have wanted their own sovereignty for many, many years. And it's in part due to religious freedom, but it also has a lot to do with some more uh, deeper, deeper social economical issues than what the news may be reporting. China's taxi wars taking center stage. Not only are the Uber rideshare taxi wars heating up in France and United States and other areas throughout the world, but China as well as Uber looks to take a big chunk of the taxi rideshare market. Chinese company Didi being number one here with the most growing customers month on month. But uh, a lot of taxi drivers are really pissed off about this because it's taking a chunk away of business from them. In a competitive market as it is for taxis, especially in big cities like Shanghai and Beijing, uh, it's murder. And with more companies in the mix, what this does is it puts down the earning potential for cabs, private cabs that people can can drive for Uber and other rideshare companies. One taxi driver who wished to remain anonymous said, now I only earn 2,000 to 3,000 yuan per month, only enough to feed myself. Previously, it was much more before there was greater competition in China for rideshare. That being said, I think it's a step in the right direction, though. Um, you won't hear me praising the Chinese government very often, but on this topic I will because they're allowing these rideshare app companies to open up and to compete against each other. And that is free market, my friends. That is how it should be in your country and often is not. So it's a wide open market for rideshare apps. It's a uh, you know, free for all. And that uh, is kudos to the local governments throughout China for allowing them to compete against the taxi services, the big companies that have been established here for a long time. Look at it this way. If these local taxi companies would have developed their own rideshare apps, they would have been in the game early and they would already have the huge chunk of this market. But they were complacent and they just looked at the traditional taxi cab market as being what it is and not being innovative. So innovation and competition went out and hopefully this will be a positive thing for the public in China because there are a lot of people and although there are a lot of taxis there still are not enough taxis uh, in some markets as uh, I can attest to waiting for cabs for 20 30 minutes an hour at a time in some cases another shout out to the China money report coming out of Shanghai uh, this site here by Mr. Collins is one of the best little blogs that you're going to find on economic issues in China, looking at both micro and macro viewpoints. Now, overseas industrial parks set up by Chinese, now part of national policy. I talked about this before, and you can read it on this site, the ChinaMoneyReport.com. And basically what it's saying today, there are over 100 industrial parts set up by Chinese companies in foreign countries. Uh, and the 16 largest of these parks contributed to over 10 billion yuan in investment, created over 40,000 jobs as of end of year 2014. Now, this might be a little misleading, though, because a lot of the employees at these industrial parks are Chinese workers. So they're coming to a country near you. They're setting up industrial parks. They're making it look great. They're saying they're going to invest money in infrastructure in the projects, but they're bringing in Chinese labor. So it's not really having the effect that it could on your local economy. When you consider that a lot of these automobile manufacturers, take for example from Japan, are setting up factories all over the world and they're using parts from the local countries and they're em employing uh, factory workers and white collar workers from that local country so although it is a bad thing in my view it does have some benefits if the company is willing to be ethical and uh, stick to its promises and make sure that they employ local labor, they meet with the local environmental concerns about pollution, 
and of course they also have uh, agreements with local labor laws paying overtime health care and things like that so um, Toyota uh, being one of the companies that does in fact uh, use a lot of local American made products for their factories and hire mostly American labor so uh, it's not as bad as it may appear, but a lot of these Chinese companies are simply not doing that. Greek ATM runs dry Greece defaulting on their obligations to the EU, and why shouldn't they? It's a bum deal for Greece. It was a bum deal for Greece before they even got into the European Union. They had no business being there. They had no business of calling in Goldman Sachs and the baking cabal to cook their books to get in in the first place. It's simply not an economy that can compete with the bigger economies in the EU. So any kind of agreement with the EU, IMF, World Bank, is a bad deal for nations like Greece. They should have kept the drachma, they should have done what they do best, and that would solve a lot of their problems that they're going through today. Now, this uh, Greek default that we're seeing, it's not a, as huge an issue for Greece as it is for the EU, okay? If Greece falls, other nations will fall. It will be like a domino effect because they'll say, hey, Greece got this deal on their bailout. Greece didn't pay their obligations. Why should we? So this is really more important for the EU than it is for Greece. Greece really um, has lost uh, a lot, almost everything. So they've got nothing to lose by exploring options of going to the drachma, looking at other ways to get out of this bum deal, while the EU has everything at stake here because we know that France, Italy, Spain, and other nations in this EU are having the same kind of problems, and it only means more bailouts, bail-ins, and massive unemployment and loss of sovereignty.